Today's topic is going to be all about programming, automation, Excel formulas, code, and all of that fun stuff. For those of you who don't know me, I am Molly Pfaff. I work in the Faculty Success Center, and essentially we help faculty become effective users of technology uh, in their teaching practice. So I want to give a clear disclaimer that I am not a regular coder. I'm not a software developer or an expert in AI or Excel or any of these things by any means. And I think that's a little bit the point today is that I just have an interest and a curiosity and ChatGPT has made that easier. You don't need to have any coding experience for this workshop. This is not going to be a coding uh, learn to code workshop. It looks like we have a mix of faculty and staff here. So I'm going to introduce how ChatGPT can be used as an enhancement to writing code formulas, both for students and for professionals. And we're going to talk about how that potentially influences our behavior in the classroom as we're teaching and possibly the workforce that we are preparing students for. So I'm going to start with what is ChatGPT, just a real brief introduction, since I know many of you are probably familiar, but it's basically a new and rather powerful AI chatbot that was released by OpenAI in November of 2022. I have read that it gained its first million followers in five days, which for context, the first iPhone, the first smartphone took, you know, more than 70 days to get its first million users. So it's quite popular and it's kind of taken over the media. As of February 2023, there is a free version, although it is sometimes unavailable. It has been quite busy during the day recently. There is also a pro version. This is a fairly new release where for $20 a month, you get the always available version. It is also faster and you get access to new features more quickly. And that is actually the version that I'm going to be using today. So the first thing that I want to point out, since we're going to be talking about creating our own like little programs, please do not enter any private purpose sensitive, college sensitive information into chat GPT ever. It is not a FERPA safe platform. So, you know, keep your personal stuff out of it. Keep student data out of it. I will say that again, at least one more time, because I'm not a FERPA expert, but I know that we want to be extremely careful with how we use this tool. So the first thing that you do to get started is to create an account. If you've, if you've already done so, you can log in at chat.openai.com. If not, it will prompt you to create an account and you can do so. And then once you're in, it's going to look something kind of like this. Essentially, you can enter a prompt at the bottom. And as a tip, you know, if you hit enter, that's going to send it. So if you hit shift enter or shift return, then you can enter multiple lines of text if that's something you want to do. You can change your prompt. If you hover over um, a prompt that you have previously sent, you can use this little edit icon that looks like a pencil in the bottom right corner. And that will let you sort of do a redo of that prompt. So you can rewrite it. It'll delete the response that ChatGPT gave you before, and it'll, it'll give a completely new response. Or you can just keep your current prompt and have ChatGPT Try again, just get it to generate a new response. These responses are not necessarily something just pulled directly from the internet. This is all based on data that the AI was trained on up to 2021. So anything past 2021, it may not have good understanding of unless someone has taught that to it, but it is not just going out to Google and pulling results. There is a version of ChatGPT that is linked to Bing and is an early release now. You may have heard of it getting a little bit wild with the re those responses, so I don't think it's quite ready for prime time, but that one's hooked up to the internet. This one is not. This one is pre-trained, so you're getting every response as it has been trained to give. The next thing you can do is if you want to stop ChatGPT from generating a response, it's, you know, especially if you're doing code, it's going to give you long, long, long responses potentially. And you know, that might drag out if you want to, you know, want to stop it, you can just hit the, the stop button. You can also rate responses, which will help train it. And we'll go to the researchers, just click the little thumbs up or thumbs down icon that appears over one of ChatGPT's responses. If you get an error, usually 
you know, if I'm doing this for long enough, it'll time out. And so basically you just have to refresh the browser page and that will usually fix that error unless it kicks you out because it's it's too busy. ChatGPT is very kind and will save all of your past chats automatically. So those live over here on the left-hand side. You can actually, you can start a new chat thread up here at the top with the new chat button. You can also rename or delete a saved chat thread if you do not want to keep it, or you want to rename it so that you can find it easily later, which can be quite handy. As a tip, ChatGPT does remember messages from the current chat thread only. So it will, you can reference messages earlier in the chat, but only in the same thread. It's not going to remember messages from other chat threads because they're separate processes. And then we've got some other options like dark mode, you can toggle, which is kind of handy, et cetera. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with a demo. And we're going to be, in my demo, I'm going to be using three coding languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which are, you know, website coding languages, if you're not familiar. And my point here today is that I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about the code itself. We're mostly just going to see how far ChatGPT can get us on its own. Spoiler alert, it's not going to take us the whole way most of the time. Some kind of understanding of code is really necessary in order to get more advanced, but it can get us pretty far and it can get us, I think, farther than most people have seen up to this date. So it's pretty, it's pretty spectacular. So the, the prompt that I am going to give it is write the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for a simple tip calculator. That is the program that I want to create today. And I'm going to, here's my, okay, I'm going to get into the actual browser. So here's ChatGPT, and I'm going to write that in. Write the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for a simple tip calculate, calculator. Send. Sure, here's a simple tip calculator using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Interestingly, it labeled this HTML as PHP. <laughs> So as it's generating, this is what HTML looks like. If you're not familiar, everything is inside these tags and pretty much you've got a start and you've got an end and you can tell it's the end tag because you got this little slash going on. So everything in between, that's all going in, inside the head. And then we've got the body that starts there and ends down there. And then everything in between is the structure of our tip calculator. And then we've got CSS stands for cascading style sheets. This is going to make it pretty for, you know, lack of a more complicated explanation. And then the next thing it should do is generate the JavaScript, which will actually make it be a tip calculator. Without that, it doesn't have any engine to it. It can't really think or do or interact or animate. So we have this, we have this code. So what do we actually do with it? And notice, oh, this is, this is something that I think is quite amazing. In this calculator, users can input the bill amount and slide a range input to select the tip percentage. Once they click the calculate button, the tip amount and total amount are calculated and displayed below the buttons. It's explaining what it is doing, which is cool. The ability for, for ChatGPT to explain the code that it's making, especially when you're trying to test for errors, is I think my favorite part of, of this whole technology. I'm going to use CodePen as my example today. And this, now this is a completely separate website from ChatGPT. So we are no longer in ChatGPT. This is a website called CodePen, and I'm just using it as a space to actually put my code. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the HTML. I've got the little copy code button there that is really handy. And I'm just going to paste that into the HTML box and zoom in a tad. So you can actually see. So I've got three boxes, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and I'm going to paste these into the corresponding box. So the HTML goes here. And I'm not editing anything this first time through. I'm just going to paste that into CSS and JavaScript. And we will see, oh, we've got, well, it looks like a tip calculator. It's not going to do anything without the JavaScript. 
Okay, I've got one error here. That's what this little exclamation point means. If I click on that, it's warning me that just HTML that goes in the body goes here. So the way that CodePen works, it actually doesn't need anything outside of this body tag. So I could delete all of this extra stuff is what is warning me. I'm going to ignore that for now because it doesn't actually break anything. And yeah, so let's see, let's type in a bill. Let's say it was $10. and slide the tip percentage. Let's say we do a 20% tip and then hit calculate. And there we are, 20% of 10, tip amount is $2, total amount is 12. Let's do 40%, let's do a negative number. What happens if we try to break it? Okay, it gives us a negative tip. I mean, that's fine. That doesn't really break anything. Let's try zero, see what it does. Okay, gives us zero. That's accurate. Let's try not a number. Let's try to enter like, okay, it literally won't let me enter any letter except E. Let's try. It just doesn't do anything. When I enter E and hit calculate, it doesn't, which is interesting because I actually did a past version of this. Let me show you the, and it's doing all of this on the fly, by the way, because I actually did this cal tip calculator earlier. And it looked completely different. So here is the tip calculator that I generated earlier in preparation. So this is, again, you know, no modifications. This is just what ChatGPT gave me. And so again, let's do 10, $10, 20% tip. There's no slider on this one. And it gives accurate numbers. And if I try to put E, so this one actually gave me an error message. So it programmed an error message. If I don't put a number in here or I don't enter anything, it tells me that something is wrong and what I'm supposed to fix. Whereas this one did not build in any error messages. So it's completely generating a new thing each and every time. I will give you a disclaimer that it is rare that you're gonna be able to build a tool without any corrections whatsoever, but we can talk about that. Let's see. I'm going to take a look at the chat. What if you ask ChatGPT to add comments to the code? I require this from students to verify comprehension. Great question. Sometimes it does comment the code and it's kind of random when it does or it doesn't. So a comment for anyone who's uninitiated is basically just like text that you put in the code that doesn't affect the code. It's, it, it, it gets ignored, but it's just for human commenting. So you can keep track of what the code is about. So I'm going to, you know, this is a comment. You can see I put this, you know, double slash in front of it to tell the machine that, you know, in JavaScript, that means that this is just not code. It's just comment. So what happens if I ask ChatGPT, right? The, I'm only going to do one of these at a time. Rewrite the JavaScript to include comments. Sure, here's the same JavaScript code as before with comments. So now it is saying that, you know, this part is, the comment is get the necessary HTML elements. Define the function that calculates the tip amount and total amount. Get the values of the bill amount and the tip percentage input. So you can see we've got a variable here called bill amount kind of like variables in algebra, you know, when X, you have to solve for X and X could be like a million different numbers. It's kind of like a variable in coding. So bill amount could be a lot of different things. It could be a number, it could be a sentence, it could be, it could be, a you know, a bunch of different things. And here we have, it's getting the value of our bill amount input, which from up here, that is the part of the document that has the ID bill amount. So it's finding the, the part of the document that has the ID bill amount and it's getting the value of that and it's storing it here so we can use it for later. And so then in the comments telling you what that, what that actually means that it's doing. Calculate the tip amount and total amount, display the tip amount and total amount with two decimal places, update the text content of the tip percentage output when the user changes the tip percentage input, call the calculate tip function when the user clicks on the calculate button. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you, ChatGPT. That was very helpful. 
<laughs> Peter said, yikes, it's better and more concise than 90% of my students. Yep, it is. It is nothing if not a great communicator. So it's going to be difficult to determine if a student is doing their own work. We will have to modify how and what we want students to do. This is great. Like this is exactly what, this is why I was hoping, you know, CIS faculty would, would take a look at this and, you know, faculty who teach all different types of programming. I'll do an Excel example later, but I also just want to show you some of the other experiments that I've done. Like I said, most of these are not going to be complete programs without any, you know, without needing any modifications. So here I let's just open some of these. So I did a Wordle game, believe it or not. This one required more modifications for sure. And let's see, I'm gonna put that back, sorry. And so let's go to Wordle. So we'll just take a look at what I asked it instead of asking it to do it all over again. Sorry, I have to scroll all the way to the top. Okay, so I asked it write the HTML and CSS for a Wordle game. And here's an example of how you create a basic Wordle game. Gave the HTML CSS. It actually gave me the JavaScript. I don't think I, I actually didn't ask it for the JavaScript, but it just like decided to be an overachiever and it just programmed the game for me. And it was actually a working game at that point. Surprisingly, I was not expecting that. I tried again to create a working game in one go and I, it, it, it failed. So it, that was interesting that it just, that it just worked. Oh, it almost worked. So this is one of the errors that I run into a lot is if you have a button to click on, oftentimes you'll click on it and it'll just you'll get an error that just says not found you. So I, now I just ask it, you know, prevent the default action of the submit button because it, it often leaves that out of submit buttons. I won't get into the technical reasons for why that is or what that means, but that's one error that I run into a lot. It modifies the code for me. So you can see I it presents the same code, but with that modification, presents new JavaScript. And then I said, I wanted to add a button to restart the game. It just kind of stopped once the game was over. Modify the following code so that clicking restart prevents the default behavior. So yeah, it had a real hard time getting that button to prevent default behaviors. For some reason, it just like over and over again, it was not working. So what I did eventually, I asked it, you know, you can see I've got three of three here. So here's the previous versions that I asked it. So I said, modify this so that clicking the submit button prevents the default behavior. That didn't work. So then I said, modify the following code. And then I forgot to paste the code. <laughs> so I did it again and I pasted the code in there. And that's one of the ways that you can debug with ChatGPT is to paste your code in there and say, hey, fix this, or hey, what's wrong with this? Or, you know, whatever. One of the problems with ChatGPT is that it tends to, if you say modify the code above and you don't reference the actual code, Weird things happen, like variable names will just change randomly, which can be really frustrating because that breaks things. So pasting code multiple times, especially if, again, you are not a strong coder, just, you know, repasting the code in here multiple times and having it to debug it is one of the tips that I think is really helpful. And so I actually got, we're going to step away from, from looking at code and I'm just going to show you some of the things that I made. All of the, you know, most of these within just one afternoon. So I've got a Wordle game. I'm obviously not trying too hard. Oh, please enter a five letter word. Okay. We're just doing all the plurals. Game over. The word was essay. So I did modify it to, you know, game over after six tries. I modified it to these emojis were not in there. I, I added emojis instead of just like text. And then, yeah, I, I modified it. I, and this is all I asked yet. Chat GBT, please modify this. Please modify this. And I added a restart button. Some other things. Let's see. The Pomodoro timer also almost worked right away, which was kind of amazing. So you can have a little Pomodoro timer that after 25 minutes, it invites you to take a five minute break. I didn't test it all the way down to, to the, to the 25 minutes though. So I don't know if that part works, but I can reset it grocery list. So I can add an item to the grocery list. I don't know. I already said cookies. That's okay. There's that. Now note that if you're using code pen, if you want to play around with this yourself, that CodePen is not gonna save anything persistently. So if I refresh this page and come back, 
my list is not saved. So this is not like the best place for something like a shopping list where, you know, you need to come back to it later. Something else to know about CodePen is that everything I've done here is completely public unless you pay for this. I have a free account with free accounts. This is all completely public. So again, not the place to put any sensitive student information or anything like that. I'll just show a couple more. I asked it to do a little drawing board and to, it gets, it gets messy if I have to scroll up and down. You can see it's kind of, <laughs> there's, there's some weird bug here where if I'm on the left side, it draws perfectly, but if I'm on the right side, it starts drawing a little bit to the right of my mouse. So that's weird. I don't know how to fix that. But what I can do is change the color. And this is all stuff that I asked it to add. Like, hey, can you make it so that when I change the color, the last five colors that I used get added to these squares? And it just did that for me. Now I have about, you know, I have two college classes worth of coding experience. I have an intro to computer science class, and I have Marty's Dreamweaver class. Thank you, Marty. And that's where I'm at. So that's that's my background in coding. And then, you know, just some personal projects that I've tried. I'm not the strongest coder by any means. I don't know, Molly. These examples make it look like you know how to code. It does. And that is very much the point, <laughs> which is I did not have the skill to do any of this. I just had the basics and a lot of curiosity and chat GPT. So that is why I'm happy to, you know, show you guys. This is, this is one that I'm kind of proud of that I've actually used. I'm going to go to full page view. So this is a caption editor that I has been like on the back shelf of my brain, like forever, like, well, one day maybe I'll like code well enough to be able to do this. And I, I got past the point where I was stuck in like two hours because of chat GPT. So here you can upload a video file and you can, if you play it, it shows the current timestamp of the video. I can, and then the idea here is that if I wanted to upload some captions, if you hold down one of these keys, if you've ever, edited YouTube captions, it doesn't bother with capitalization or punctuation. And I always wanted there to be a way to just very quickly add in that capitalization punctuation. I'm sure that AI is going to come in and make caption editors like this completely obsolete in about six months. Here's hoping, knock on wood. But, you know, in the meantime, I've actually managed to use this. You know, most of the hard stuff that I did here was just me you know, modifying what ChatGPT gave me. And having the skill to modify it was definitely something that I brought to the table myself. But, you know, a, you know I could not have gotten to this point without without the input of ChatGPT. I'm going to take a look at the chat now that I've been ignoring. Well, Molly, um, all of those, yeah. if indeed six months, a year, whatever it is that an AI like this starts doing captions, on top of everybody uploading their videos to get those captions, they will have just given away that IP in that video for the AI to use in the future. Thank you. That is a great point. So something I was going to bring up as well is that currently the U.S. Patent Office and the U.S. Copyright Office, normally when you, normally when you create something, it's pretty much copyrighted to you. I don't, you know, I'm not a legal scholar, so don't quote me, but if you create something in general and you can prove that you created it first, you've got some kind of copyrightability. That is not true for things that come out of ChatGPT or any AI generator. So if you're thinking about using this for your own projects, be very careful because right now the Copyright Office, in the US at least, this is going to be different by country. And this is very, very, very much something that is being decided in the courts today. You know, this is an ongoing thing, but they've decided that it needs to have human influence and human input in order to be copyrightable. And I'm not going to go into what that means. I think the degree of human influence, you know, is writing the prompts enough for it to be human influence. I don't think that's been quite decided yet. So just keep that in mind. David has written, has had a whole book of scary stories written and published by AI. And he's fully aware that you know, if any of us wanted to, we could go and take those stories probably and sell them ourselves if we wanted to, because he doesn't have any kind of copyright 
claim over that necessarily, but maybe he will. Maybe the courts will decide that, you know, becoming a curator of the AI and writing these prompts will maybe grant you copyrightability, or maybe there's a certain extra step that has to be done in order for it to be considered your own human input. That That is to be determined. That's very much being decided at the moment. Uh, I, I think uh, writing the prompts would be an interesting question because as the AI gets better, the same prompt may generate an entire different response. That is true. Yeah, and that's a good question. It's it's going to be interesting to see what gets decided. But yeah, keep an eye on that. So Peter said, I started to use oral exams for online programming classes to verify students can actually explain how their code works. I'm curious how ChatGPT handles more complex .NET, heavy GUI projects, and C-sharp, for instance. Students often struggle to successfully copy and paste into Visual Studio 2022. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, and I don't have the expertise to test that or to know that. One thing that really helps with doing ChatGPT is knowing the very basics. So having at least a basic vocabulary in the programming language that you're trying to produce. And one thing you can do with ChatGPT is ask it, to kind of give you that language sometimes. Keep in mind that it is not always accurate. It is always confident, but it is definitely not always accurate. It will make blatant mistakes, something definitely to talk about with your students. One issue I did run into related to what you said was I tried to use ChatGPT to help me build a Chrome extension. And it was it just happened to be timed where ChatGPT was trained up through data from the internet uh, through 2021. Right at that moment, Google is switching and is no longer supporting whatever standard they used from 2021 and earlier for their extensions. And so ChatGPT only knows the old one and it cannot give you accurate answers for the new one because it hasn't been fully trained on it yet. And so that is something to consider as well is that like, you know, libraries and coding standards and coding languages that get updated frequently or get import big important updates, AI may be lagging behind just on the basis of how it works, which is it's pre-trained on something versus having current live input. That said, future variations of ChatGPT might get live input from the web, kind of like the version that is plugged into to Bing right now. So we will see if that continues to remain a limitation. So just some advice if you want to try CodePen. I'm gonna do an Excel formula next, just because not everyone here is here for, you know, programming languages. If you want to test with CodePen, you can just visit CodePen.io. There's a start coding button. You can just start using it right away. You don't necessarily need to sign up for an account. If you do want to sign up for a free account, that is needed if you want to save your work for later. Keeping in mind, again, that everything you do is going to be public unless you have a pro account. So this is this is a pen and think of pen as like an enclosure, like a pig pen, not like a pen that you write with, I think. And so you're going to put your code in these boxes. You can either type it or copy paste it. And anything that goes in the box is going to generate a preview of your website over here. You can't edit the website directly. There's no drag and drop editing to going on there and then you can save your work change your view and yeah so that's and then the coding languages that we used i'm not going to go super in depth but just so you're aware html creates the website content it's not pretty doesn't do much by itself so you know i've got a grocery a shopping list here you can see the tags are building this shopping list but there's no style and if i clicked this download button it wouldn't do anything whereas css stands for cascading style sheets, it adds style. It makes the HTML pretty. So I've got my the CSS for the shopping list here, and you can see it's a bit prettier. Just for an example, because I thought this was kind of humorous, this is Wordle with CSS. This is Wordle without the CSS. So that is, if you need to know what CSS does, this is why it's important. Yeah. And then JavaScript, which is not the same as Java, by the way, if, if, you're, if you're unfamiliar, Java and JavaScript, two totally different things. And that makes the website interactive, dynamic, animated. It actually kind of makes it do stuff. There's other programming language that makes website do stuff, but for 
our purposes, JavaScript is a good one to sort of play around with. Oh, and if you wanted to see some of those other coding projects that I was showing you, including the code, if you want to play with it, you can do whatever you want with it. It's not really mine anyway. That repository of all of my ChatGPT experiments is located at this website or at this QR code. I'm going to do a quick example in Excel. So let's jump to, so I'm not actually using Excel, I'm using Google Sheets because it was just easier. So I have a little example here with where I'm taking attendance in my own little spreadsheet. And so what I want to do here is be able to, I already set this up where I can set this as attended, late, absent, but I want it to calculate the points earned based on that. I'm just going to pull up the one that I used before. So I asked it to, so first I asked it how to do the drop-down menus and there's no formula for that. So it told me step-by-step -step to add a drop-down menu cell in Google Sheets. You can use the data validation feature. Then I said, write a formula for H2 that divides F2 by G2. I decided to take the approach of using the actual cell references because I was I knew I was going to be referencing them later. I could have just said, you know, I could have maybe explained my table and said what the column headers were and then said, you know, write a formula that divides total points by total classes. I know how to do this by hand, but you know, maybe you're someone who does not. It gave me this formula that I can just copy and paste. So that formula ended up here and it's dividing total points by the total number of classes so I can find out how many points there are per class. Next thing I want to do is take that and apply it to the actual points earned. I'm going to put this here so that you can see what I'm actually referencing. So basically if they attended I want them to get 100% of the points per class. If they're late, I want them to get 50% of the points per class. If they're absent, I want them to get zero. And so, I, and again, this is the approach that I decided to take. I'm not an Excel expert by any means. I'm even less of an Excel expert than I am a coding expert or an AI expert, believe it or not. So this is the approach that I took and it seemed to work pretty well. There's probably other ways that you could ask it for these answers. So gave me the, gave me the formula. And then it explains it. <laughs> so paste that in there. And there we go. And so if I, I don't know how to get rid of that suggestion. There we go. So now if Jane Doe was absent, zero, late, oh, that didn't work. So what's going on? Why didn't it work? So I said, this didn't work in cell D2. I want H2, because I noticed here, I put H2, and here, now it's doing H3, which is empty. This is H3 right here. There's nothing here. So, you know, I want, I said, I want H2 to remain the same, not calculate based on H3, and said, I apologize for the error in my previous response. It didn't give me an error. It just didn't know what I wanted, but it's very apologetic. To make sure that the formula in cell D2 uses the value in, in cell H2 instead of H3, you can simply use the absolute reference for cell H2 by putting a dollar sign symbol before the column. So then it gives me a new formula. Oh, and then, oh, there we go. So now you get the idea. If I wanted to go further with this, I could have it try to calculate the points, you know, the points earned subtotal by students. So, you know, John Smith's total versus Jane Doe's total. There's so many like different little additions that you could potentially add to this. I did do one uh, database example. So I did a, let's do, 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 do. Oh yeah. I just did a silly little example. Um, where I wanted, a, I wanted a SQL query to see if it could do them. So I said, I have two tables, one called guests with the columns ID, name, and birthday, and another called preferences with the columns ID, name, and favorite cake flavor. Write a SQL query to list guests by name with their favorite cake flavor. So, you know, I, I wanted it to do a certain type of join in SQL. And so it generated that. And then it said, you know, it gave me an alternate version. So it said, no, if there are any guests, who do not have a corresponding entry in the preferences table, they will not be included in the results of this query. If you want to include all guests, regardless of whether they have a favorite cake flavor, 
you would use a left join instead of a join. So it gives me alternate scenarios. It predicts where I might potentially mess up and gives me an alternate scenario. And it's not going to do that all the time, but it's trained on, you know, what exists out on the web when it was when it was given its training data. So this must be something that maybe is Googled a lot, lives on, you know, Stack Overflow or whatever. And so it picked up that this caveat is very common and it predicted that it should give me this caveat based on its past training. Again, it is not pulling directly from any particular article on Google. It is it is generating new sentences based on its training data. So I'm gonna go look at the comments again. So this back and forth with ChatGPT is, is still easier and less frustrating than manually writing if statements in Excel and Google Sheets. Yes, it super is, especially if you're someone like me who I struggle with working memory sometimes. So I will be in the middle of trying to figure out an Excel formula or in the middle of trying to read someone else's code. It's like trying to draw in an Etch-a-Sketch during an earthquake. It just like disappears halfway through and I have to start over, which is really frustrating and ultimately is the reason I kind of burned out on coding. And so you know, a tool like ChatGPT, well, it definitely, 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 absolutely has downsides and it has potential harms and bias, especially bias towards marginalized groups and other issues that definitely warrant talking about. It also has some real potential good, like, you know, students who maybe have a disability or maybe English as a second language. That said, maybe English as a second language is going to be harder because if you don't write the prompts perfectly in English, maybe you'll have more trouble with it. But then if you're trying to write output that is in English, you know, maybe you can write your cover letter more easily when you're applying for a job. So, you know, there's this, there's this huge balance that is absolutely worth discussing and examining, especially us being at a community college. We can try to use that to the advantage of our students and hopefully minimize the harms. Remarkably, it is uppercasing the SQL keywords, which is, which while not required is quite common and generally the thing that students don't grasp quickly. If ChatGPT can write COBOL, our financial systems are saved. I will be doing some examples by passing a batch of openly available data to see how well it does at generating table structures for that data, because that is some of my lab slash projects for students and I want to see how well it does. Yeah, like putting in data and having it like summarize is, an, is another thing that it can do, which is really cool. I'm hoping to do some experiments where I throw some qualitative research data in there and see if it can generate like themes, you know, common ideas that come up again and again and see if it does that way more quickly than doing it by hand. Two things. I, I subscribe to a couple of newsletters that just give summaries and someone who codes in Ruby said he tried it with, and he does it professionally, he said he tried it with like five different things and he couldn't get any useful code out of it. It might have been just because it was Ruby. I haven't tried anything mm -hmm. with Python in it yet or any of the Visual Studio stuff. So the other thing, because I've been paying attention to this for a couple months now is that a math teacher got on there and said, now English teachers know what we had to deal with when calculators came out. So <laughs> yeah. that is very true. I love that. Yeah. So getting useful. I've, I've also talked to yeah other people who have used chat GPT to code and sometimes it gives you good stuff and sometimes it just gives you not. And so a lot of the stuff that I made it, it hit a point where it was really struggle bus and, and so it might give you code that doesn't work, especially the CSS and JavaScript in particular. HTML seems to be pretty good, but it doesn't really understand visual style and the JavaScript can get overcomplicated. It changes variable names randomly. So it substituted these two. So like get contrast ratio became calculate color contrast. And for, you know, FG color became foreground color, BG color became background color. It just switched out those variable names, like midway through the conversation without any like, you know, reference to it at all. So that's where copying and pasting code can be helpful. Sometimes it gives you a really long answer when there's just like a simple existing JavaScript function that can just do it for you. And instead it tries to like recreate the wheel. Long responses are going to get cut off. There is a, there is a character limit. So you might try asking like, give me everything after, and then paste a line of code or, you know, rewrite just the function named you know, get contrast ratio or whatever. I've had mixed success with that. Sometimes you have to regenerate or reword it to get that to work. But oftentimes, once you get to longer code, definitely with the 
the caption editor I made, I, I was doing it piecemeal where I was not asking it to do the whole JavaScript over and over again. The more you iterate on one piece of code, the more likely it is to get kind of corrupted. And then of course, errors and timeouts if you're not on the pro version. Some tips for getting the most out of ChatGPT. I'm not gonna read through these cause I'm gonna you know, send you guys the PowerPoint. Start on scratch paper. This is just good coding advice is to draw or write out you know, what your code is supposed to produce and what it's supposed to do like step-by-step. Step. That's just, that's just really, really good coding advice in general, but then be specific. Learn the basic vocabulary is really helpful. You can sometimes ask ChatGPT to help you find that vocabulary. If you, if you ask it, how would you go about building an Excel attendance sheet? It might explain, you know, using some of this vocabulary that you can then pick up on. Forking, which is, you know, fancy way of saying make a copy. If you're, especially in CodePen, you know, make, make plenty of copies because it might give you bad code in future. So you don't want to like lose that past work that you did. And of course, Google is your friend. Some tips on debugging. I really, I was really ambitious about how far I thought we would get in this presentation, but here's some debugging advice using ChatGPT. You know, I'm getting the error message blank when I use this code and then paste the code itself in there seems to be a good thing to do and then copy pasting the code and just saying, you know, Hey, what's wrong with this? And then making sure to check that your IDs and your JavaScript and your HTML actually match. So if you have an ID color form, you know, make sure that you actually have something with the ID color form in your HTML. Otherwise it's not going to be able to find anything in your HTML. Thank you guys for coming. I hope this was not too into the weeds and was helpful. I'll send this PowerPoint out to everyone afterwards.